Welcome to the healthmanagement.org Digiconf Novelty versus Legacy Finding the Balance Healthmanagement.org Editor-in-Chief IT Christian Lovis, Professor of Clinical Informatics at the University of Geneva, will moderate the session. Our panellists include Dr Thierry Klein, Coordinator of Medical Information and Security Advisor at CHR Holt Sen Hospital. Hans Eric Henriksen, Independent Consultant specialised in healthcare and digital health. Dr Ursula Muller, Senior Expert in Health Management, Innovation and Education. Professor Geraldine McGinty, President of American College of Radiology and a radiologist who specialises in the detection and diagnosis of breast cancer. Dr. Elikem C. Tamaklo, the Managing Director of Nyaho Medical Center in Accra. Let us welcome the moderator of today's DigiConf, Professor Christian Lovis. So Christian, many thanks for this uh, opportunity to uh, discuss about uh, novelty versus uh, legacy. Uh, uh, I, I welcome uh, the speakers and the participants. I will try to keep uh, in these uh, 10 uh, minutes uh, for the introduction. Uh, we will have uh, uh, five uh, 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 presenters uh, now. Uh, Hans-Erik Eriksson is coming from uh, Denmark. He's a former uh, CEO of Healthcare Denmark and now an independent consultant specialized in healthcare and digital health. Um, he has worked uh, many years for IBM uh, Healthcare and uh, Life Science uh, in a large part of uh, North and East uh, Europe. Um, so uh, we will um, uh, have the pleasure to have him uh, discuss on uh, strategic opportunities on COVID-19. Then there will be uh, Thierry Klein uh, of Belgium. I, I, I hope he will uh, have uh, the goodness to speak with the same type of accent that I do. So um, <laughs> Thierry uh, was a chief medical information officer uh, in a hospital uh, in uh, Seine. Uh, he's a, um, also a scientist at the ULB Public School of Public Health, and uh, he's doing a lot of uh, activities in the, in the field of uh, management uh, of medical information and uh, teaching in the field. He will uh, discuss about uh, how to, uh, in practice, uh, do coded patient summaries uh, and present us some uh, nice uh, new approaches uh, on the subject. You, you might know that being able to actually really build a patient summary is one of the most important challenges we are facing. Uh, the more we have digitalization, the more the patient record they grow. And the more the patient record they grow, the more it becomes complicated to read and understand these records. And uh, summarizing a, a patient and encoding a patient uh, um, in, a, in a summarized way is, a, is a, by far not easy and much more complicated than people think. So then we will have um, uh, Geraldine McGinty from the US. Uh, she's a professor and chief strategic officer at Whale Cornell Medicine. It's a physician organization. She's also the presi president of the ACR, the American College of Radiology, and she's assistant professor in radiology. So, um, uh, and she works at the New York Presbyterian. Uh, you, you stop me if I do uh, say anything wrong, you or anybody else. Uh, she's a passionate uh, advocate for quality uh, imaging and uh, the role of this uh, imaging in uh, delivering uh, good uh, healthcare. As I am the director of the Department of Radiology and Medical Informatics here in Geneva, I am especially uh, uh, interested to hear about this uh, in this uh, time where we are trying to shift the complete uh, role of radiologists from uh, 
delivering uh, 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 a service uh, which was doing uh, uh, images to, uh, to try to create a complete uh, environment uh, for diagnosis and uh, prediction and, uh, uh, and even deciding uh, which type of modality is uh, required. So um, she will uh, discuss about the need for the diversity and more inclusive workforce in healthcare. I again apologize for my accent. I spent uh, several years in the US, but even at the end of my stay, I was unable to uh, order a, a, a Burger King uh, without just giving the number of the menu. I, I, I could say menu seven and I could be understood. So, uh, voila, voila. That, uh, well, bon. And then uh, we have uh, Dr. Ursula uh, Müller aus, uh, aus uh, Germany, from Germany, sorry. Uh, she's a senior expert in health management, innovation, and education. And she's also the head coordinator of the task force for home care in Bavaria. So Bavaria is one of the really nice region of uh, Germany, uh, especially for food, and for uh, the capacity of the Bavarian to uh, fire. And, and to drink beer also, and produce beer, by the way. So, uh, but uh, this, uh, this is just to say that she's also uh, supporting the Bavarian Health and Food Safety Authority. So she must have a lot of work, and uh, especially during that pandemic. And um, she will uh, uh, present and discuss with, you, with us a lot of what she has learned in his... Uh, uh, work as director of the AIT as, uh, in Europe, and there are more than 90 partners around challenges, challenges uh, of introducing uh, anything novel and changes in healthcare. I suppose it's correct, but basically change management in, um, in healthcare. Uh, I remember the PTAC report of 2014 for Bush, uh, where they said, uh, it's a, it's sci medicine is a science. It, they said that in 2014. Medicine is the science of the 21st century and the process of the 19th century. So it's, uh, and it's probably true. And then uh, we will uh, uh, have uh, Dr. Elikem Tamaklo from Ghana. And uh, uh, he will, is a managing director at the Nairobi Medical Center. He has um, studied medicine in the UK and uh, is um, very active in uh, promoting a cooperation uh, between uh, private and public sector and, um, and many different uh, stakeholders. He is also uh, a successful entrepreneur and uh, he will uh, present and discuss the use of virtual care and digital solution. And I suppose that uh, it's uh, not just nice to have, but must to have uh, in Ghana. So as we have uh, experienced the must have uh, in Switzerland um, because of the pandemic. So uh, voila, I have uh, two more minutes, I think, uh, Christian, uh, before you sleep. Uh, it is a joke, sorry. <laughs> uh, but my point was um, really uh, in, in, the, in this invitation you gave me uh, several months ago about novelty and legacy. Um, I am in this uh, business of uh, medical informatics, clinical informatics since uh, a long time. Uh, I don't know, 30 years, something like that. And... Uh, it's a, it's a real uh, uh, fact that every year we try, every year since 30 years, uh, we try to, to abandon legacy um, and, to, and to move into novelty, which itself is becoming legacy and uh, prehistoric things a few years later. And in fact, th there is no uh, legacy and novelty there is just a movement uh, in the future. And uh, the, the, the young guys of today, they are the old guys of tomorrow. But as, we, as I am uh, for my, uh, if, if, I, if I speak with uh, my son, for example, Michael, um, 
is uh, 22 and uh, for him uh, everything what is above 30 is old and about 40 is very old about 50 it's mummies so uh, <laughs> so but, but, uh, the reality is that uh, I, I would say there are, there are three uh, type of things there are uh, the things that will remind us uh, forever young and as people you are people they, they 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 are born young and they stay young there are the one that will be always old they are born old and they stay old and there are the ones that changes and uh, I, I am a, uh, an experienced teenager and every year i am a, a one year more experienced teenager and I think that somewhere uh, this this uh, distinction and this uh, combat also uh, between uh, novelty and legacy, I experienced it with Cobol, uh, I experienced it with Smalltalk, with Pascal, with Fortran, with C, with C++, with Java, and with Python now. And every five years, you have the old technology and the new technology. And... Uh, and um, every time in the IT, we develop something more, uh, something better, something faster. We will, and the radiology is a good example for that. Every time we multiply by 10 our capacity of storage, they find a way to multiply by 100 the capacity of image production. So whatever we do, we will always be in this, uh, in, 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 in this transition between what we did five years ago and what we will do in five years. And after these words, I give you back the, the, the virtual meeting. And if not, then uh, I will, I will uh, suggest to start uh, with our first uh, speaker, Hans Eric. Uh, and uh, Hans, uh, you have the you have the the word. I will uh, close my mic so that you can speak. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for a very good uh, introduction. Uh, from my point, uh, I my point is that um, uh, when the pandemic COVID nineteen pandemic is over, we all know we will return to a new normal. We will return to a new normal uh, in, in general. We all expect that we will see more working from home. We will see more dialogue with virtual meetings. We will see less uh, travel. Of course, there will be a lot of travel, but in general, we will use uh, the virtual uh, media uh, and uh, teleconferences uh, ever more in, in our general work. And the same goes for, for healthcare. And my, my point is that uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis is actually a window of opportunity to accelerate uh, the uh, transformation of healthcare and the adoption of digital health. And a good example on that is, uh, is what is going on in Denmark. You're probably all aware that in Denmark, uh, we are highly uh, digitalized. We are highly digitalized as a country in general but we also highly digitalized as a country in, in healthcare. At the moment, all Danish citizens, they have electronic access to their full electronic uh, healthcare record and a secure e-health portal where uh, as a citizen, I can access my full electronic health record, all clinical notes from hospitals, all clinical notes from general practitioners, all my lab results, all my medicine information. I can have an electronic appointment in e-consultation with my general practitioner. Uh, I can change my um, uh, choice of uh, medicine to a different generic through the e-health portal. In essence, I have my healthcare in the palm of my hand and I have digital access. And the same goes for all clinical professionals who have me in treatment regardless of where in, in the country, they had the, the same access to my full electronic uh, health record across the country. And then some of you might ask, okay, but if that is the, the situation in Denmark, where do we want to go from there? And that is the point of the new digital health strategy of Denmark, where we are now moving uh, digital health uh, from being about having a computer available to having the access in the palm of your hand. 
We are strengthening the, the digital relation with the citizen. We are moving this access to your personal electronic health record to your smartphone. We are starting this digital journey from the, the point where you, uh, you engage with the Danish healthcare system. That is the general practitioner, because in Denmark, the general practitioner is, uh, is a gatekeeper. So one of the first initiatives in, in this new digital health strategy is the doctor in my pocket, uh, the, the app where you uh, document uh, your booking and your encounter with a general practitioner when you approach the general practitioner with, uh, with a new problem, and then kind of uh, you have a linkage to that app from other apps kind of following your uh, your pathway uh, through the healthcare system. So the new digital health strategy is about taking the next step. Uh, it's about five main objectives with 27 initiatives to be uh, implemented. It's about patient reported outcomes, having that stronger digital relation with the, 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 the patient. It's about patient empowerment and uh, more uh, telehealth and, and uh, more services in a digital way and more accessible services uh, for the patient. And it's about uh, integrated care and coherence in the healthcare system using digitalization to connect the healthcare system. But first and foremost, to make the exchange of healthcare data real time. We're moving from a situation where, yes, we can exchange the data electronically. Yes, we can build this electronic health record on a national level, make it available for our citizens and our healthcare professionals. We're moving to towards a situation where this becomes more real time, where you can imagine you go to a general practitioner instead of going to an outpatient clinic to, to have the, the next step maybe that general practitioner will immediately connect to a specialist at the hospital and uh, give you that guidance and next step uh, while you're at the general practitioner. So, so that's what it's all uh, about. And the point is that what we have seen during COVID-19 is actually an acceleration of that strategy for very good reasons, because every, every time we can substitute a personal contact with a digital contact during the crisis, we do something to hinder the outbreak of the, 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 the crisis. So as one example, we have seen uh, with the, the doctor in my pocket, it was foreseen that in one or two years, uh, time, it should be possible with that uh, app to have a teleconsultation with your general practitioner. That has already been implemented and obviously, especially our elderly citizens, they are very in favor uh, of that functionality. So now they can not only make uh, a booking of a consultation or an e-consultation, they can also have that consultation through a teleconsultation with a general practitioner. Likewise, we have seen general practitioners and specialists uh, uh, exchange information uh, the same way virtually instead of physical uh, meetings. So that's one example on, on how uh, the, the, the crisis has actually accelerated uh, digital opportunities, accelerated the implementation of this uh, strategy. Uh, other examples uh, are the general uh, use of our capability in the infrastructure connections uh, of Denmark when we, when we needed to uh, get a real time and immediate overview of the testing status, we just used uh, the, the dots uh, already being there between the, the hospitals, the clinics, uh, the, the general practitioners, our municipalities to establish that. Uh, immediate overview and obviously as, uh, obviously as you can imagine right now we are also uh, thinking about how we can support uh, the logistics around uh, vaccines. So alongside with these digital opportunities we have also seen uh, a breakthrough in the culture. A lot of things that were not possible, uh, is especially to implement in a short time frame for our clinicians and our healthcare professionals suddenly it was possible because there was this sense of urgency of the, the, the crisis. So, so we have seen that what has been difficult with the silos and the culture and healthcare, a lot of those blocks were moved because we have a, had a crisis. And my point is that that is also a bit of, of opportunity. Uh, if it's possible to preserve that special culture, if it's possible to motivate uh, keeping the progress that has been made in, in digitalization, uh, it can lead to a new normal in, in healthcare, which will help us uh, progress uh, healthcare transformation going forward. So, so that was my uh, uh, points and the introduction. Thank you very much.
So thank you very much, uh, Eric. I, I think uh, Hans Eric. I, I don't know if I have to say Hans Eric or Eric or Hans. Hans Eric, please. Hans Eric. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I prepared one bad question per person. I am not sure I can ask you it now or later. I will see with, uh, I, I, I just need a okay from Christian. But, uh, I, I am really impressed. I have been uh, extremely involved in uh, COVID uh, management prediction for, the, for our public state hospitals in Geneva State, where we had all the cases of the state of Geneva. And I was, I was really impressed by the data that were available in, in Denmark, uh, at least the one we could access, uh, and we could access uh, a lot of data. And it was a little bit an exception in, in Europe, the density of data. Well, there were some other countries in North Europe, uh, the, the usual bad guys, uh, Norway, yeah. and Finland, uh, Sweden, and so on. But it was really impressive. Uh, I, I don't want you to ask, but at the end, uh, the Denmark uh, did not uh, um, did not uh, uh, suppress the second wave better than uh, Italy. Uh, so I, I, I will not ask you to give me uh, some opinion of the of your government. We can see now that the third one is well managed in Denmark, much better than many other countries in Europe, but not better than Spain, uh, with, with with which has uh, uh, near to none of the data and the telemedicine and the legal framework. Uh, for uh, EHRs uh, like, like, like in Denmark. So what is the contribution of IT? We uh, can uh, the, the contribution. You said all of it. What would be possible? But what was possible? You're, you're definitely right in some of your, your, the points you are, you are making, and that is also being debated in, in Denmark at, at the moment. Uh, could we have made a better use of the, the very powerful data gold mine, as, as we call it in, uh, in, in, in Denmark, in, in handling the, the pandemic? And that is, that is probably also some of the, the things that will be looked into uh, uh, evaluating the, the, the pandemic. I, I, and I also agree with, with, with you that, that my view uh, on, on how uh, Denmark has been performing is, uh, is a little bit back and forth. In, in some periods during the, the pandemic, we've probably been doing better than a number of countries. And in other periods on, of the pandemic, we have been uh, not uh, placed so, so, so well. So, uh, so, so I agree in, um, in, in, in your views on, on that. I think we will, we will need to see the end of the, the pandemic and, and the crisis before uh, it, is, it is the right time to, to really evaluate how different countries have been managing and, and to learn from each other. And we have also a question from Anna Batista. She's a nurse uh, doing uh, case management and international care in Portugal. And she asks, uh, how do you handle all the people that, that for any given reason or decision, haven't have access to, uh, to tools uh, that can connect us with the digital world? And, and that is also a, a very good uh, uh, question. Uh, you should uh, remember that, that one of the reasons why we have this uh, high degree of digitalization in, in, in Denmark has to do with the general very good coverage of access to the internet and also uh, smartphone uh, um, uh, cell coverage in, in Denmark. We have virtually no areas in Denmark where you, 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 you don't have access uh, to the uh, the internet. That's one point. The other point is that because the digitalization strategy in healthcare is is actually closely linked to the public digitalization strategy of Denmark, already in 2014, we demanded from every citizen that they can communicate electronically with public authorities, and that has, of course, driven up the adoption of uh, tablets and, and smartphones. And actually, what we saw in 2014, when that was mandated, was that it was proportionally more of the elderly citizens who were ready by the deadline to communicate electronically, they had got their tablets and their smartphones and they were actually happy that now they could have Skype meetings with their grandchildren. And, and all the young citizens that you were also hinting to uh, earlier, Christian, they said, uh, 
uh, electronic secure mailbox, what is this? We want our sharing of information through uh, Facebook. So a less proportion that expecting of, the, of those were actually ready by the deadline. So you should keep that in mind that the, 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 the general level of digitalization and, and, and public uh, sector digitalization in Denmark is helping us in, in healthcare because it's a public healthcare system. I envy you, I am jealous, voila. <laughs> so, uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for this intervention and uh, the, the, the beautiful example of, of Denmark. Uh, it's not only a beautiful land, it's, uh, it's also a beautiful digital land. So thank you very much. And now uh, there is no more question and I, I will uh, go to Geraldine. So uh, Geraldine, uh, if, you, if you allow me to say Geraldine, in, in French, uh, it's not uh, that usual to say uh, first, first names. So um, if, you, if you allow me, uh, I will give you uh, the voice. So, uh, and uh, voila. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh, I probably really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'll keep my remarks brief because I'm conscious that we uh, are on the second half and I, I don't want to uh, take too much time so uh, let me just say that, you know, with the, looking at the title of this panel, uh, when we're talking about novelty versus legacy, I'm a radiologist and, you know, we have innovation in our DNA. We thrive on technological innovation, but the term novelty in English actually has sort of a negative connotation, something that's not lasting, something that's not serious. And the idea that we would think about diversity, which is what I'd like to talk about as a novelty, I think is not necessarily where I'd like to position it, position it because the fact that we are even considering diversity as a, an innovation is really a sign of our failure as, as a healthcare system. And, uh, you know, I wrote this piece uh, after seeing one more, we'll call them, Manal, where there were no people of color and no women in a discussion around the future of healthcare. And when we look at the healthcare workforce, women are significantly overrepresented. And in most countries, especially in the US, the diversity of the healthcare workforce outpaces the diversity of the population they serve. And yet when we look at leadership, it is very rarely reflective of the communities served. Um, now we know there's ample evidence largely in the business literature that diverse teams outperform. We also know that healthcare, a healthcare workforce that more closely reflects the population it serves actually drives better healthcare outcomes. So there's, there's ample reason that we need to do this. Also, you know, groupthink um, can really be fatal, frankly. Um, I think we've seen examples of that in the business literature with the Challenger disaster, but we also have seen, I think, some decisions um, you know, certainly I'm going to say it here in the US where we, we, you know, had people hewing around a particular political ideology that have really cost lives. Um, so I think we're, you know, I'm, I'm anxious that we think about diversity, not as a novelty, but as an investment in the future performance of our healthcare system. I will just say one more thing, which is that we cannot be performative when it comes to diversity and inclusion in healthcare. We can't just pluck people and put them in leadership so that we can tick a box around diversity because it's not just diversity of the team, it is how empowered each member of the team feels. So how do we do that when you know, you're coming in perhaps as a first person of color or a woman or a person from a sexual minority? You know, how do we make sure that you feel empowered to bring your voice and your unique perspective and lived experience? Well, that's where I think it's so important to institute mentorship programs and really make sure that the conversations are inclusive. So I'll stop there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I, th there is no question from the public, uh, so, uh, but I, I certainly have a, a lot of questions for you. It's a, a huge, uh, uh, it's a huge challenge today to uh, to make sure that we uh, handle properly uh, these uh, um, differences. I I I I like the word uh, diversity uh, uh, rather than minority. Um, because at the end of the day, we are made of singularities. I am a singularity. We are all rare persons. 
We are all rare diseases, so to say. We are all rare cases. We are all unique. And uh, one of the dangers which we know today uh, in uh, artificial intelligence is all these, ge these uh, gender bias, these et ethnical bias, these uh, various bias that are built by nature, by big data. Uh, just because big data is not small data. <laughs> in, uh, in my country where everything is small, uh, we are 8,000, 8 million people uh, in, at all, uh, and the largest city is 1 million people, and it's Zurich, and they used to say downtown Switzerland because they feel big, uh, and it's probably a village uh, for the US and uh, for many other countries. I, I don't speak even about China, where it must be a, a, it's, it's a block. <laughs> so um, I, I prefer the, the, the naming uh, which you use, the diversity, and how do you see the capacity of uh, digital tools uh, which we embed in our systems, which we use also for human resource management, where we can see even more AI than we have already in, uh, in, uh, in radiology. How can you see these tools actually not being basically biased by the people who build it and by the data who feed it, feed them? It's a great question. Let me say I'm very enthusiastic about the possibility of artificial intelligence and other innovations to augment my performance as a radiologist and enable us to deliver life-saving imaging services to a greater number of the world's population. But as you say, if we don't have a diverse group of people building these systems, if the, the voices of the patients that these systems will serve are not included in the design process, and if we don't have the right kind of uh, ethical roadmap and the right kind of regulatory environment, we absolutely are going to see the potential for bias to be not only perpetuated, but amplified. So this is absolutely a concern. We've seen it play out in bail algorithms. We've seen it play out in Google's photo uh, algorithms, you know, so it's it's a very real problem. At the American College of Radiology, our Data Science Institute published an ethical roadmap in collaboration with a number of other societies. I think also the collaboration between physicians, scientists, developers, industry, and very importantly, a diverse group of patients is critically important for us to leverage the potential of AI without, you know, uh, running into those problems with bias. I see a question or a comment from Bianca about the cost and absolutely, you know, we even in even with sort of legacy imaging, uh, we see a huge disparity across the world in terms of access to imaging. We just published a uh, Lancet commission that, that really shows there's a business case for investment in, in, in imaging infrastructure, but that doesn't mean that it isn't a huge challenge for low and middle income countries to, to invest in imaging and, and invest in these innovations. Thank you very much. So uh, I will move uh, to the next um, uh, panelist and uh, we, I, I feel we will have to go a little bit faster because I speak too much. Uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, Ursula, I leave you uh, the voice uh, right now. Thank you very much, Geraldine. I just connected with you on LinkedIn. So, Ursula, the voice is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much, Christian, for uh, having me speak. Thanks, everyone, for the invitation. Also, a big thanks uh, to the past uh, two speakers that I think I could build on very well. Because similar to Hans Eric, I also want to make the point that uh, COVID-19, despite the whole crisis we have faced and are still facing, I see a big window of opportunity to actually accelerate innovations in health and healthcare, both in terms of technology, but also in terms of management and actually also in diversity. So also there are some risks involved here, but I kind of try to focus here on the positive sides because I think the pandemic has shown us that a lot of things have been possible, which otherwise would have not been possible. And I want to quickly outline the examples what I've been working on for the past year, mainly setting up and heading 
the task force care homes uh, in Bavaria, which was explicitly uh, kind of installed to protect the elderly, uh, mainly people over 70 or 80 living in long term care facilities. And the reason why this was done, that we kind of said, okay, we need to really do something here was that uh, soon uh, when uh, the whole SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic started, uh, we realized it's, um, it's very bad for everyone, but it's a real death threat uh, for this uh, elderly population. And especially when they are living closely together and uh, also have kind of multi-mobilities. So, and in Bavaria, we have around 150,000 people living there and we just uh, basically the government decided they didn't want to risk that the care homes have to take care of them only themselves but some support was needed here so what what uh, the authorities did was basically setting up a huge task force from experts where i am included now in the uh, bavarian health and food safety authority but also hygiene experts uh, from the medical insurance companies um, and also local experts who are basically both from private and and also the authorities uh, in charge of managing matters there on the local side and i think the interesting thing was uh, that kind of this was all in the state of emergency group together so that we were belonging to one organization and really were able to collaborate and work to protect them and deliver also uh, services directly there at the care homes when there was an outbreak for instance we sent uh, hygiene teams that they walked through there and helped them to initiate measures so it was not just kind of theoretical guidance so to say but hands-on support directly when it was needed and um, what we also did, uh, similar what what uh, Hans and Herrick said at the beginning, that we built the strategy also, at least on the second wave, on data, so that we kind of uh, tried to collect data about the outbreaks on a kind of daily basis, so that this could help us guide where the infections uh, basically were running, uh, which was also a novelty, especially in Germany beforehand, where people are still very reluctant in terms of kind of collecting health data, which is a little bit different, I would say, uh, from the Danish perspective. Um, not in terms of the use of technology, but the whole mindset uh, of data security. So, but but I think we, we made a good case and managed to get the system up, um, which I think during also the last several months helped us to get the infections down from about about just in this group of people from about 7,500 infected, now it's about 300, and we kind of know what's going on where. So we could even if kind of a new uh, wave is coming, uh, jump in much, much faster. And I think what, what the whole thing highlighted is on the one hand, we, 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 we had to build on legacy structures, also both from public and private, but we were able kind of to uh, uh, include this kind of diverse team where we were talking on a daily basis with each other or virtually because we were spread out all over and are still uh, and it was not kind of this usual hierarchy where you don't talk or, or you don't know if you should talk to them or just you know go to your superior or whatever but everybody had the same voice and was feeling empowered like what you also Geraldine said before this empowerment is so important and because there was this emergency here uh, it was just the, the whole other structures didn't matter that much anymore. Secondly, I think what also what we learned is data matters because having the right data, and I think this is similar to the Danish example, helped us uh, to kind of uh, be guided directly to go there where help was needed. And at the end, for sure, also the subject matter expertise, both from kind of the care perspective, but also from hygiene and, and general medical perspective and infectious disease perspective, but also pulling it together. And I think that the learning is here now, okay, we had to focus on in, in this kind of time and urgency, and this is still the modus we are working on at the moment, but I think this is something will also be transferred to after uh, COVID-19. And I think there are elements which then also will speed up the digitization of health services, but also the collaboration, which then I think gives good ground to really bring those innovations forward, which are needed for the patients uh, and the citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, I, I, I cannot more than agree with you. I will not uh, ask you a question. I will, uh, uh, there is no question from the, from, from the audience, I'm sure there, are, there is a lot of stuff to say. I would have a lot to say, but I will just uh, move uh, directly to Elikem so that we uh, 
I have uh, 10 minutes to, for the final discussion. So Alikem, uh, the voice is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And obviously I'm speaking from um, Accra, Ghana. And as I listen to all of you speaking, it's, it really highlights how different the experiences of um, COVID-19 and the response has been in the issues that are so complex and diverse. Um, if you look at Ghana and if you look at Africa, the issues which pertain to access to healthcare are long-standing legacy issues of lack of infrastructure. Um, you really don't have a, a centralized organization or government or structure that can actually coordinate. So you have this dichotomy of public sector and private sector. And you have to look at the legacy. How did that come about? Because healthcare financing requires um, just a different approach when you look at how our systems have been structured over the years. So you do have this kind of silo mentality as to how do you coordinate across different sectors, public and private, but at the same time, how do you respond to something that is affecting every single area of healthcare? And I think that was what we had to face. And so when you look at our, our organization, we are the oldest private sector organization in Ghana, um, have a long history of pioneering so we were the first to kind of completely digitalize uh, health operations with um, electronic medical records in 2015. And as we're doing that, obviously looking at telehealth, uh, teleradiology, all of these were high cost um, initiatives where you don't really have, um, you're funding it directly from your revenue, which comes from patients. So that cost to the patient, how do you manage the cost structure um, and how do you subsidize innovation? And so when it came to um, how do we respond to this COVID-19, obviously virtual care was happening across the world. We thought that that would be an, a, um, a solution. But as you implement, you realize that that deep user empathy is extremely important because the same rules don't apply. When you look at um, healthcare, healthcare is completely mobile. I mean, sorry, when you look at technology, you look at mobile is first um, in, health, in African countries, mobile first in terms of FinTech, um, when you talk about payments, it's really about mobile, mobile payments. Um, the use of desktop is not common. Desktop is more, mostly used, used in commercial. And so when you look at how to get access, um, you need to look at the, the 3G, 4G infrastructure. Then you bring in the data, so quality of data, so video is a high cost when you start looking at um, the cost of um, doing a, a call on the video versus audio versus text. And so it's not surprising that WhatsApp is the biggest platform that's used for information move um, in, in um, Ghana. So, you know, virtual, when we started to implement our assumptions around virtual adoption, virtual clinic adoption was actually um, a learning experience. And it's about pausing, um, going back to the users. Um, the different users are not just the commercial entities who um, fund healthcare to a large extent but the individuals, and we realized that we had to adapt and we couldn't use the same rules. So we found that we had to leverage the specialist care that we provided and create access by um, getting patients um, to work with specific um, like COVID-19 clinics, um, because that's really where the, the specialists might be limited. There might be only a few specialists. Um, how do you increase access of these limited human resources? And that's where we saw the benefit of virtual care to increase access by increasing the number of people who could access those clinics as compared to the old way of physical. And then the last thing to talk about is innovation in terms of people in the diaspora. So we found a lot of conversations, a lot of Ghanaians, lots of Africans in the diaspora in the US and the UK. Now, when you start to look at virtual clinics and you look at the virtual environment, you can start to leverage their um, contribution back to their countries but you use technology to help um, in terms of the human resource challenge. So it's very complex. That requires us, the same issues don't, the same rules don't apply. It takes us to take a step back and take it by um, case by case. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eli Kem. And, uh, and, and uh, yes, uh, I, I, I think that we have a lot to learn. Uh, uh, from uh, from from countries where uh, the resources have uh, uh, teached people to use uh, original and new ways. Uh, at, at least when I when I see what we have learned in Switzerland from what 
comes from uh, uh, the people uh, working uh, in uh, in in Africa and the the raft uh, network uh, essentially. Uh, it it has been impressive, uh, and and there has been a lot of uh, use, useful uh, learnings there. So I will uh, now give uh, the voice to uh, Kerry. Uh, so that uh, it, 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 it can uh, end up this uh, panel uh, uh, show. Uh, thank you, Christian. Um, thank you to invite me to this uh, webinar. It's very interesting to, to, to look at the other experience. I will just uh, uh, tell my, my personal experience in a little hospital in Belgium. And when I came in 2015, I was in a queue to, to buy my sandwich and I, I met for the first time the head of uh, internal medicine and he said, oh, welcome, welcome Thierry, uh, what are you doing here in, in our hospital? And I, 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 my answer was, oh, oh, I want to use terminology to you reuse data uh, in an, well, only one principle. And he said, okay, maybe we will discuss uh, later on because I don't understand anything. So um, my challenge was to simplify the message. And the, the, the challenge was to, um, to move from a legacy system. This is the EPR system in our hospital. It's just a, a big typewriter, you know? Every doctor was using the system. That's the good news, the, the bad news that Mainly, mainly the 90% of the data were text. And if you want to, to have a glance to a, a, a record, you, you just have to, to read um, uh, a report from an internal medicine because every department has uh, his own clinical history system with text. So this was unreadable. And so I have the opportunity to to propose a little dictionary in SNOMED City, this uh, international um, terminology. And it was 6,000 terms. Uh, I would say it covers uh, about 80% of the reason of encountered in the emergency department. So I say it's a good start. In fact, it's not. it was not a really good start because uh, one of uh, fifth, uh, five patients, the, the, the doctor has to say, I don't, I don't find the, the correct term and the correct, correct code to, um, to, to, to mention the, the problem of the patient. So uh, later on, I have the opportunity to install a big one dictionary in French, and it was um, um, 170,000 terms, and it covered the majority of the case in, in emergency. And that was the, I would say, the, the, the big news to, to, to go forward. And um, I have tried to simplify the work of the, uh, of the doctor in emergency department. Three clicks and 30 seconds. That, that's the, the goal to enter a main diagnosis and one of two comorbidities for each patient. And the results was uh, successful because it was really, really easy, easy to use. And you don't have to um, ask to the doctor to enter twice the, the same data because we have to, to send the diagnosis, not only for the continuity of care, but also for the financing uh, system, uh, diagnosis related groups, you know, the, the systems, and, and also to a lot of registries, mandatory registries. Um, and we, we, in, in with this system, with the patient summary, we can use just one data entry of diagnose and many users. And, in, with the COVID crisis um, in April 2020, uh, I have added two, only two codes to begin. It was COVID infection and suspicion of COVID infection. And it was from, from, many, from the start of the first vague in Belgium. And so um, we have the opportunity to follow the COVID patients and to send the data to um, the authorities. Um, that's the situation today. Uh, we have to 
um, to go forward to the future. And the, the new future is to, um, to distribute these patients in the network of hospitals we have to build with other hospitals in the region. And we have to um, promote new way to enter data. Uh, I think of natural language processing um, to, to transform text in code automatically, offline and online, and also the voice recollection, because the, the goal of the project is not only to have the data, it's also to save time to the doctor. And this is uh, my first priority. I thank you. So oh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Thierry. I hope you hear me well. Uh, I still uh, have some fights with my uh, with my IT here. I will complain to the IT. It's good <laughs> to say it's the fault of the others. So um, yes, well, I, I would like to thank uh, really uh, sincerely uh, all the five uh, presenters and panelists uh, for these uh, five different uh, insights. Um, Maybe it's um, about uh, this, uh, this uh, movement we are all uh, experiencing, uh, forced by the pandemic, of uh, dematerializing many of the, of the uh, encounters, uh, activities uh, that uh, we used to, uh, to, to do in, uh, in, in physically. Um, and especially with patients, but also with colleagues, uh, humor boards and whatever, many, many um, meetings uh, the, uh, which uh, were organized uh, in person uh, or, or, uh, or uh, encounters uh, are, are dematerialized by necessity. And what, uh, uh, what can we learn? from each other. So we had the, the good uh, presentation from, uh, from Elikem, uh, but how, how can we move uh, forward in, in this uh, dematerialization, I would say, without, uh, without going too far also. I, I think at least for me, this uh, distance uh, work uh, with my team, with, uh, with everybody at the university, at the hospital, during the first months, I was really happy to be uh, all the time home. And then uh, it was uh, less, uh, less uh, nice. And then it was no more nice at all. And, and now I have a Zoom meet, acute and chronic uh, Zoom meet. Uh, I, I don't support uh, this virtual thing at all anymore. Uh, I am getting allergic to, uh, to uh, videos and uh, all these things. I, how can we find the right way? So I will ask the question to Eli Kem first because <laughs> you have no, that's more great. experience. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, our every experience, I mean, going back to your experience, you know, I think that um, what was interesting for us is that, like, similar to everyone's experience, I found the digital transformation in the organization in the beginning, very difficult. Um, we had been using Microsoft Teams since 2017, but the adoption was you know, below 10% because everyone was so physical. Um, now, as an organization, I would say that that's really helped us. Everyone is now using Microsoft Teams because it helps us to collaborate more. But going to what you said, the balance comes from asking the question, because what is right for us in this organization might not be relevant in other organizations, in other circumstances. And I actually believe that we need to do a lot, of, a lot more questioning, a lot more deep empathy, because um, it's really going to be very different. And I love what you said. You said, we're all rare diseases. I mean, that really is, um, the, the, it hits the nail on the head, because um, what works for you at this stage today will be different from, from tomorrow. So we need to be very flexible. We need to be very agile and, and, and spend more time questioning um, and then before we um, execute. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments on this question? Yeah, I think Alakim said it very well. Um, I think that we've seen huge benefits in being able to disseminate educational content. We could have done it before, but we didn't. 
Um, but for our teams, I think a combination, it's Zoom's getting very old. <laughs> I also would build on this. I think we need to go back to a balance where we mix more physical with distant. What I still like about the whole distant thing is that you can also be more spontaneous. And I think you can also, you know, you don't need to travel so long, especially when you have teams at different places. So it's much more easy to get everybody together for just one hour. So I think for, for those more brainstorming things, also discussing things, you can do a lot virtually. And I think this also can give people voices, what would otherwise be difficult when it's everything so formalized. But I think we also need to go back and kind of in the whole normal feeling uh, where we kind of see each other physically and can kind of touch each other to have the, the real empathy, which somehow gets lost uh, between um, in this whole virtual world. But I would still kind of make the point that uh, with the whole virtual world, we can get many more elements than we didn't have before. Uh, just, just two little comments, Christian. Um, first, first, the, in my service for the coding system, we have an improvement of the performance uh, by uh, seven, seventeen percent. So it's better in, in tele, tele working. Um, and the other plus point is the participation of the general practitioner to the meeting, the multidisciplinary um, oncological meeting. And that was too um, too long for, for the general, general practitioner to come in the hospital to, to, to speak with the other doctors. And so uh, thanks the, the telecom, they, they, they come back. But, but it's in balance. I prefer face to face to, to get the, I would say the, uh, the contact, the physical contact with the colleague. And this is uh, a balance to, to find in the future. And in my presentation, I talked about a new normal, and, and I think you have all described what that new normal kind of is. That is finding out how to blend the virtual contact and the benefits for healthcare with the physical contacts. And right now we are having an imbalance where we, we need, need to do everything virtually. I think when we get after the pandemic, uh, we will see if we grab the right opportunities, how we can blend in the, the virtual uh, healthcare opportunities uh, in the right way so it benefits our transformation going forward. So uh, uh, we will stop here. I thank you all very much. Uh, I, I, I will uh, keep uh, as a, this uh, ending uh, uh, result uh, what uh, Hans Eric uh, and uh, Thierry said, uh, well, all, all the others, of course, too, but. Uh, it's the last one I remind, and uh, I, as I am a, a red fish, I, I, I just have a, the last uh, 10 seconds in my head. But it's a positive point. Uh, this positive point is we are uh, moving to a new balance. It's a new equilibrium. Uh, the, the healthcare has experienced a tsunami. Uh, a, a new uh, equilibrium is uh, currently being uh, made by force. And uh, it's, it's probably good. Many uh, of the pioneers uh, in the field have fighted uh, decen decennies uh, to, to get what the virus uh, built in a, a year. So I, I think this is, a, this, this is an important point. It's, it, we need, uh, we need to, to go to this new balance. And the other point is that there are many improved things. And the, the, the fact that uh, the GPs, they attend more our colloquy, I can see it here too. It has, a, it has a really, it's a multiple of what we had before. It's not five percent more, it's a multiple. And, uh, and this is a very positive thing. The density of the relationship with the partners, the patients also have, uh, have increased. But this also will uh, require a new balance on how we organize our work and uh, our workforces, our resource, our time. And as we all know, uh, since we Zoom, uh, I, I work all night, uh, almost every night. <laughs> um, again, uh, it's, it's a positive uh, vision and uh, I, I am optimist. I think uh, it's important uh, to, to have an optimistic uh, approach in this world. We have learned a lot and we have applied a lot 
and uh, I thank you all for this uh, contribution and the participant. Uh, I will give the word to um, um, Christian so that he, he can do his uh, wrap up, his, uh, his uh, raising his finger. I, see, I saw you, but I wanted to speak a little bit more. So Christian, uh, you take the word. Participants, dear panelists, dear Christian, it is amazing how much you get out from a digital talk as we call it, then from the written word. And in particular you, Christian Lovis, I would like to thank you for your long years friendship and support of this great health management project where we promote management leadership, winning practices in order to make and create a better, better healthcare. In particular, as this is as unfortunately, but completely understandable, your last activity for health management as editor-in-chief because due to health reasons, he is going to retire. Out of the whole team from Maria, Samna, you name them all, we all want to thank you in biggest times for the great support you have given us. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists as well. Okay. Thank you for watching Novelty vs. Legacy, the DigiConf in line with the healthmanagement.org journal. Issue 3 of healthmanagement.org will highlight issues related to human matters. The publishing date is 19th of April and the DigiConf will be on the 27th of the same month. This DigiConf was brought to you by MindBite Communications, streaming healthcare.